was also the car. So we're just going to flip that around. So we're just going to do neuromuscular pathway first. Uh, hopefully, no one has a problem with that. I did see some discussions in the chat saying, hey, um, I know a lot of people want to do cars, but it'd be nice to have also some of these science topics. Now, to talk about cars, to, to, to kind of expand on that too, it's really, really important that you know you incorporate a lot of cars, strategies, and method methods because cars, more than any other section, in my opinion, is all about knowing the test, getting into the AMC's mindset on how to look for answer pathologies and how to even navigate the right answer. So I think it's worthwhile to do cars numerous times and build upon um, numerous car lessons on that and, and look at different types of strategies that will be of benefit. Uh, one of the examples I always like to give on cars, for instance, is uh, when you have a main idea, for instance, if you know it's a main idea question stem, uh, so it's asked, you know, what is the main thesis of this passage? What is the main idea of this passage? Right? There's a no, number of ways to say main idea. But when you're looking at those kind of question stems, one of the strategies that I tell our students about is, well, look at answer pathologies. And specifically, the AAMC loves, 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 loves to use psychology against you in cars. And so they like to use what's called the premise and the recency effect against you. This is something I've mentioned before in the channel. Specifically, like to use paragraph arguments or arguments made in the paragraph from the first paragraph and the last paragraph and try to confuse that or muddle that up with the main idea. So if you can recognize that the paragraph arguments made, specifically a paragraph argument even from the first or the last paragraph as is most common, then you know it can't be the right answer. And so on Tuesday, we'll talk more about these kind of strategies. And so if you were to go to, if you were to, go to Vegas or Gambling Man or, or I guess Gal, uh, you could win more poker hands than lose. That's, that's what we're trying to get at. And so I think, you know, if you follow this and you practice cars every day, meaning you do two to four car passages every day, maybe two in the morning, two in the afternoon, using car volume packs one, two, one and two, as well as the newly released car diagnostic test or resource of the AMC release, I think you'll be in a good spot to improve your score. I think minimum to 127 or higher. Uh, but it has to be on a near daily basis because cars for a lot of students is something they try to avoid. It's not a fun topic to talk about. It's not exactly the highlight or something to get jazzed about, but it's super important because it's the only way to do better at it. And a lot of, for a lot of students, cars tends to be their lowest score. So take it seriously. Okay, take it seriously. Uh, okay, so neuromuscular pathway, just like last, or I guess early in the week, I'm going to probably do a little bit of hot potatoing and ask you guys uh, to kind of pitch in, right? Make this a little bit more interactive. Um, it makes this time go by a little bit faster. Uh, and so you guys don't have to hear me talk the entire time. I know for some of you that may not be a problem, but I also want to make this as engaging as possible. So when we talk about the neuromuscular pathway, uh, what we first talk about is kind of the, the the structure of the neuron, right? That's kind of where everything happens. That's where the magic happens, per se. That's where the, the message or the signal transduces from or gets generated at. So let me draw a neuron and... Uh, maybe I'll do it in blue. And then when, once I get done drawing it, I'm going to just kind of call on people to kind of label some of these things, some of the anatomy of a neuron that's that are important to know. And then we'll get more and more complex, right? We always try to go simple and then add details to it, right? You don't want to just put a whole lot of details in front of you to start off with. So let me draw kind of the spiky head. And maybe I'll try to draw this just a little bit bigger. It's fine. And draw this long body here. And then maybe I'll just do one terminal bulb, although it's possible to have more than just one terminal bulb. And so maybe giving away just the end of here, that's fine. But can anybody tell me what these spiky things are on the left hand side? What are these spiky things right here? The spiky hairdo that Sonic the Hedgehog would have. What are those called? Dendrites. Yeah, they're dendrites. Perfect. So they're dendrites. And what is another name for the cell body, where the nucleus is at? What is that called? Soma. Yeah, that's maybe I'll just kind of do like an outline of maybe, you know, maybe a circular outline of the cell body ish or the nucleus, I guess, where the nucleus is found. And this is going to be known as a soma. Excellent. And what is this, this little 
curved spot called here where it kind of transitions from the soma to the axon. Let's label that as axon real quick. So this is the axon. What is that trans that intermediate phase between the soma and the axon called? Is that the axon hillock? Yeah, it is the hillock. Good. And why is the hillock so important? What happens at the hillock? Isn't that where the signal starts, like propagating? Yeah, exactly right. This is where the action potential, the signal, let's put AP for action potential, um, that decision is made at the hillock, right? So the action potential originates at the hillock, good. And as I mentioned, at the very end, on the far right, this is known as the terminal bulb. And this sometimes can be more than one bulbs for, for plural. And so now that we kind of know kind of the basic anatomy of a neuron, what we're going to do now is talk about what's happening or what occurs during an action potential. So recognize that, right, the membrane or what's inside of the neuron and what's outside of the neuron, the extracellular milieu or environment, have differences in polarity, right? This is a very polar environment. So we've got a bunch of positives on the outside of the membrane. And if you want to, and a bunch of negatives on the inside of the, act of the neuron during um, resting membrane potential, okay? This is known as the resting membrane potential when we have these differences of positive and negative. Now, when the enough signals accumulate uh, at, at the hillock and there's enough to overcome the threshold, which we'll talk about here in a moment on a, on a graph here. We'll graph this out. But when that crosses that threshold at negative 55 millivolts, then the decision is made to propagate an action potential. And when that happens, right, we depolarize the cell membrane. And what that means is that the positive charges that were once found on the outside of the cell are now able to move to the inside. And this is known as depolarization. And now what you have are these positive charges that now travel or transverse down this axon all the way to, um, well, all the way to the end of the axon or until you start hitting these calcium ion channels, specifically we're looking at what's called voltage-gated calcium channels. Let me draw those out. This is my attempt at drawing a calcium channel. And this, so this is where calcium is able to enter, of course. And these channels open up in the presence of a voltage, right? So these positive and these negative charges are a voltage. This is, a, this is an electrical current of sorts. Okay, and so th this, let me label this as well. So these are known as, see, I can kind of maybe put this on the side here, known as voltage gated, uh, voltage gated calcium channels. And because I know this is going to be recorded for later, let me go ahead and close out some of these notifications so we're not bogged down. No one needs to see my steam. Nobody needs to know that I, I game from time to time. Okay. So when this positive charge gets to this voltage-gated calcium channel, it induces a conformational change that allows for that channel to open up and therefore allow calcium to enter. Now, why is this calcium important? Can anybody tell me that? Why do we care about this calcium so much? Why am I making a big stink about this calcium? Does that eventually like, send the signal to release the neurotransmitter like the acetylcholine? Yeah, excellent. 100%. So, this calcium is going to interact later on with vesicles 
containing neurotransmitters, right? So we may have, for instance, a neurotransmitter such as acetylcholine that's contained in a vesicle. And this, this uh, vesicle, right, it's going to interact with a complex of proteins that form this zipper-like formation. And these proteins are, now, are called, right, let me actually draw this acetylcholine first. So the acetylcholine will bind to these zipper-like proteins in green. And these proteins are called SNAP, SNAP proteins, or they're called synaptobrevin proteins. You may have encountered this before with the um, discussion of botulism toxin. Okay, so botulism, the toxin actually interacts with the SNAP and synaptobrevin proteins and prevents the release of neurotransmitters. So these proteins are important for the fusion of this neuro or the membrane, the, the vesicle that contains acetylcholine and is necessarily the fusion of the cell membrane so the contents can be released. So this way acetylcholine can be released into what's known as the synaptic cleft. And the reason why calcium is important is because it helps modulate this interaction. So calcium is required for this to happen. Calcium 2 plus. So again, we're keeping it simple, hopefully, and then we add details to it. Right? And then acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft with the, the cellular environment, the outside cellular environment. So one thing we didn't talk about here is that along the axon are um, is a sheath. And what is what is the purpose of that sheath? Anybody? Does it have like myelin? Yeah, it, it consists of myelin. So these sheaths are con con contains myelin. Good. And what's the point of this myelin? It's going to help like, conduct the signal. Are the nodes of Ranvier. Yeah, so these are made up of myelin. And then the nodes of Ranvier, or Ranvier, I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly. Wee oui, wee, oui, I don't speak French, but. Um, are these these openings? I'm not going to really highlight that. I don't want to make this too busy, but it sounds like everybody understands what those spaces are. So the myelin acts as an insulator, right? And so what that's going to do is exactly that. It's going to insulate the signal so it doesn't decay over time. Okay, just like you would with a, a live wire, you want to wrap it uh, um, so it you know those the signal doesn't get lost. It doesn't get lost as soon. Now these nodes. Can anybody tell what the nodes are for, the Ranier um, nodes? What does that do? It allows for the conduction of the signal. It allows for conduction, right? What does that mean? Like there's like breaks so that like the, basically the potential jumps from like sheet to sheet, I guess. Right, that's called saltation. What's the point of that? What does that do? What does the saltation do? What does that jumping do? makes it faster it does it okay yeah ish um in fact all it does is that in the in these in these nodes or these spaces there's actually um more channels right there's more of these channels that allow for these positive ions to go back into the axon right it kind of refreshes this signal transduction as it travels down the axon and that's what's meant as saltation or increasing conductance or making it faster because the signal will decay over time. And how we know, we, we, we know that this is going to happen, that this signal has, is going to decay because we can apply this to electrical physics. So does anybody know offhand what the equation is for resistance? In electrical physics. Is it voltage over current? Um, so you think about Ohm's law, I, I like it, but what is R actually equal to outside of Ohm's law?
So one equation you will see that you will need to know for the MCAT is R resistance is equal to rho, which is the resistivity constant for whatever metal or material you're working with, times the length over the area. And the way I remember this is the, the mnemonic or heuristic, the word replay. Replay. And the Y is silent. So R, right, and the word replay is equal to resistance. The equal sign is the E. The P is the row, the L is the length. Divide that all over A, so A is the area, and then the Y is silent because it's French. Okay, replay. That's the resistance equation. Now, what do we notice here is that when we look at this equation, right, we said, well, if we look at this equation, which does apply to biology, okay, biology is, is chemistry, and chemistry is physics, so, you know, biology is still connected to physics. And so if we have an increase in the length, right, we would expect, well, we'd expect more resistance. Right? So the longer the axon is, the more resistance the signal encounters. Okay? And the more the resistance there, there is, we have a lot of resistance. Right? The harder time that signal is going to have to maintain its strength. And that's why biologically, biology has kind of adapted this. Right? Biology said, wait a minute, let me try to cheese this a little bit by introducing not just the myelin sheath to help preserve the strength of that signal, but also these nodes to resalt right to re-strengthen that signal and so you don't get um you don't lose that strength of that signal okay so biology is incredibly clever okay so a little introduction a little injection of some electrical physics some aspects you may have not considered now there are two types of cells we need to talk about that that produce myelin okay um so one is involved with the cns and the other one's involved in the PNS. Can anybody tell me what cell produces myelin in the CNS? Oligodendrocytes. Yeah, oligodendrocytes, good. Oligodendrocytes. Now, the unique thing about oligodendrocytes is they actually, they produce multiple layers of myelin around the axon body multiple layers just keeps going around and around that axon maybe the axon here you can think of it as being in the center here okay um so it's got kind of like that cinnamon bun kind of look to it and as you kind of twirl around it you get more and more myelin in certain parts the other aspect of, of oligodendrocytes is that they can actually myelate multiple cells multiple multiple cells Right. And that kind of makes sense, too, when you think about it. Right. The brain is, is this big matrix of cells of interconnectivity. And so, you know, you probably need a lot of these cells to kind of have numerous roles. Right. Be able to kind of interact with number numerous cells and so forth, because there's only so much space. Despite popular belief. Right. Um, that that can actually that the brain can hold or that the skull can hold. Right. So the more more kind of um, multiple roles a cell has, the better in terms of saving space. What is the name of the myelin cell producing cell in the PNS? Schwann. Schwann, yeah, Schwann. Schwann. Uh, S C H W A N. Schwann cells. Okay, and so they're in the periphery, periphery PNS, and uh, they just do one little one little uh, loop here, but they also interact with one cell. One cell. Now, I don't have any clever mnemonics here. If you guys do come up with something, please post that in the chat or maybe verbalize it here. Uh, I know this can be sometimes confusing. So what I recommend doing simply is include this in your Anki deck, right? Throw this on there, say oligocytes versus Schwann cells, and have this piece of, these pieces of information on there. All right, so this is just background information. What we're going to do now is we're going to transition to what an action potential looks like. Uh, graph wise. While I'm drawing that out, if you guys have any questions about any of the stuff so far we've talked about or require clarity while I'm drawing this out, feel free to do so now. And everything I'm drawing, you guys can draw on a scratch piece of paper too or in a tablet. Okay. So when we talk about an action potential, we need to know, unfortunately, some values, okay? And so we need to know 
what the resting membrane potential is. And let me actually draw a typical um, action potential. And so you, you, it's a straight line at first. This is where the action, there's no action potential quite yet, per se, or it hasn't been propagated yet. We climb up, 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 and then what goes up must go back down. And then we, we return slowly but surely back to our resting memory potential. And so this looks kind of like what? This kind of looks like an EKG reading, right? Those little up-downs in the heart monitor, right? Well, it's very much related. Even the hearts, right? have that electrical potential, have that electrical signal. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to you that uh, it looks very much the same, okay? So let's fill in some more information real quick. So the first thing we need to know for the MCAT, and I think this is a good thing to also put on a note card, um, is that the resting membrane potential is around negative 70, negative 70 millivolts, right? So like I said, we have that negative charge inside the cell, right? When we first drew the action potential, we had the negative sign, at the very start, right? And then when we cross some threshold, and that threshold is at negative 55 millivolts, let me maybe dot that across. When the cell reaches that negative 55 millivolt threshold, that's when the hillock, at the hillock, the action potential originates, okay? And this is also an all or nothing. Let me include that here as well. It's an all or nothing response. Can anybody explain what that means, all or nothing? What does that mean? If it doesn't uh, hit the, the um, uh, a certain mill voltage, then it's not going to happen at all until it hits exactly the negative. Right. Exactly right. So if it doesn't hit that negative 55 millivolts, nothing's going to happen. 55, okay. When you close, it'll be negative 56. But if it doesn't get any further than that, it doesn't hit that negative 55, no go. Okay, can't be close, has to be right on the money or better. So once it does that, right, this action potential in black, as we climb this hill, right, once we hit that negative 55, as we climb that hill, it just keeps going, going, going. And at the apex of this action potential we just initiated, that goes up to about positive 40 millivolts. There is some variability depending on the cell type, but this is kind of the standard, our textbook standard we should be aware of. So what happens? What happens as we climb this hill, this action potential, as we're going up? Certain things open, certain things close throughout this up-down. The first thing that opens is that sodium, right? So the sodium channels, Na plus channels open. Maybe I should have left myself a little bit more space. In what direction does the sodium come in? Well, if you think about our act, we're drawing, right? We said positive charges, in this case sodium, right, would be moving in. As soon as those sodium channels open, where the pluses are, right, they're now able to move in. So sodium is able to move inside of the cell. So Na goes in. Na plus moves inward. And because there's a positive charge that's moving inward, this whole line, right, starts going to the positive. We start at this negative 55 and this negative 70, right? But as we progress upward, guess what? We're moving closer and closer to a positive 40 millivolts. And that should be obvious because we're introducing positive charges into the cell. Good. So at the apex, at the apex of, of this hill, two things happen. Any guesses? What happens at the apex? The potassium channels open. Yeah, so the potassium channels do open. Awesome. What closes? Sodium. Sodium channels close. Awesome. Yeah, so Na plus, the sodium channels close at the apex. Channels close. And the potassium plus channels open. Okay. So now we're going to go back down, right? So notice at the apex of this hill, we're at a positive 40 millivolts, right? And as we drew this action potential, this little EKG-like reading, right? We're going from up the hill. Now we're going down the hill. We're going back to the negative, okay? And this is known as hyperpolarization, okay? And does anybody know what the value is in millivolts for hyperpolarization? What is that about? You guys can guess. We have some fun with this. Maybe negative 90. Negative 90? You're on the money. I love it. It is negative 90. 
ding, 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 ding. So it is negative 90 millivolts. And so let's think about this, right? If we, if we, so let's, let's look at this apex real quick, right? We said the sodium channels are closed, the potassium channels open, and these are both positive, okay? So if we close the sodium channels, well, at that point, we no longer care about sodium, right? It's no longer a player. However, we still have positive charge in the potassium. Potassium is, is a plus charge. So what needs to happen? If we want the cell to become more negative, what has to happen to that potassium? Does it stay in the cell or does it move out? Has to be. Yeah, it has to move out, right? Potassium, the positive charges have to move out, out of the cell for the cell to become negative again, right? We're going from positive 40 to down to negative. That's pretty drastic. So when you get a lot of this positive charge out of the cell to get it back to negative, okay? Now that we're at the very bottom of this, this trough, I would say, what happens here, anybody? Sodium channel open back up. Oh, nope. The potassium channels close. Okay, so the K plus channels, right? They opened up here and now they close. So the potassium channels close. Because we don't want the cell to get any more negative, right? We said, wait a minute. We overshot that 70, right? The negative 70 is where the cell wants to be at. And we've overshot that. Hence why it's called hyperpolarization, right? And maybe I'll put a little a dotted line here in gray saying that's where the cell wants to be. But we've overshot that, right? The cells overshot that. So it says, wait a minute, I gotta close those channels because I don't wanna keep going negative. So those channels close, potassium channels close. And then it climbs back up, right? And it climbs back up with the help of the sodium potassium pump. So let's, let's make sure that we're not getting things confused, right? So we've got individual sodium channels. We have individual potassium channels. And these are different from the sodium-potassium pump, okay? Which we'll talk about here in just a moment. So the sodium-potassium pump are not the same thing as these individual sodium and potassium channels. Don't get, them, don't get it twisted, okay? Don't get it twisted. So one more thing, too. A little extra detail that you may not have been privy to is that this trough, the area of this trough, can actually be divided into two sections. And maybe I'll use yellow on the left hand side to denote one region. And maybe I'll use green to highlight the other aspect of this. Any guesses what the yellow represents? Something refractory. Is it like the absolute? It is the absolute refractory. What does the absolute refractory mean? Like no amount of um, action potential. I mean, no amount of stimulus can generate an action potential. Right, excellent. Why is that though? Why is that? Is it because the signal's not strong enough? Okay, I like it. What else? What else is going on here? Why? Why? Why won't it be strong enough? It's a simple question, right? You may have not considered. You know, I think everybody knows what the definition is for absolute refractory, or the absolute refractory period, I should say. But why is that? Why is it that we cannot get this this cell to propagate another action potential at this period, at this in this period or this area in yellow? Why is that? Anybody? A million points. Does that have to do with the charge of the cell? Good, getting really warm, almost hot. Is it because the K plus channels didn't close yet? Yes, exactly, right? So 100%, ding, 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 I love it. So what's going on here is that, right, when we, we want this cell to be at this negative 70, but think about this, right? In this area in yellow, we're getting, we're getting contradicting signals, right? We're getting a signal from this potassium moving out. And as the potassium moves out, the cell keeps going down, right? It has a ne negative or downward polar depolarization. Or, oh, excuse me, polarization. This is hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization. So as long as these potassium polarization, as long as these potassium channels remain open, right, the cell is just going to constantly go into the negative. Constantly wants to go in the negative. 
However, in order to propagate an action potential, we don't want to just go back to the resting membrane potential at negative 70. We need to go all the way back, back to a negative 55, right? So in order to get the cell back to that negative 55, our threshold, right, we need positive input, positive charge input. But we can never do that because these potassium channels counteract that because potassium is moving out. It's moving that cell towards that negative, towards that hyperpolarization. That's why it's absolute. Now, when the potassium channels close, there's no longer that negative downward signal towards that negative 90, right? Now, the cell can go back up to a positive and restart this process to, and, and get back not just to negative 70 millivolts, but potentially up to that negative 55, that all or nothing action potential, right? So that's why the green here is the relative the relative refractory period. Does anybody want me to explain that again? Uh, no, but I have a question. Why is potassium leaving the cell if there is an overall negative charge at this point inside the cell? Wouldn't potassium be attracted to negative charge inside the cell? Does, does that make sense? Um, you saw you show your ask. I think there's, there's two questions here. I'll, I'll try my best. And if somebody wants to have any input here, maybe they can have a better explanation than I do. So the first question is, why is it that potassium is out of the cell? And that has to do with the fact that the cell, right, it's, it's when, when the potassium channels open, it's at this positive 40 millivolts. And the cell is trying to get back to a resting membrane potential, right? And that's going to be at this negative 70 millivolts, okay? That flat line right here. In order to do that, it needs to move from a more positive value to a more negative value, right? So the only way to do that is to move the positive charges out of the cell, okay? And in doing so, it's going to get that cell back close to the negative um, 70 millivolts. But oftentimes, what will happen? Not often, always, it will overshoot, and that's called hyperpolarization. And at the hyperpolarization, at this negative 90 millivolts, that's when the potassium channels close. And through the process of the sodium potassium pump, as well as what's called leak channels, leak channels, the cell is able to kind of maintain this equilibrium at negative 70 millivolts where it's happy. The other question you said, well, what about this electrostatic attraction, right, between potassium, which is positive, and, and maybe some other negative charges that are floating around? That's a possibility. And you're right, you know, that there, it certainly can produce salts in the cell. Um, however, Remember that the, the cell also is an aqueous solution, right? And so what happens when you add a cell to, let's say, water? It dissolves, right? It has a potential to dissolve and dissociate. And so there's, there's an sta- equilibrium, okay? There's only a certain amount of actual salts in the cell, and there's probably a lot more of it that's actually dissociated into the ions. Good question. Never thought about it. Never thought about that one. Keep you on my toes. I like it. Does anyone want to contribute to that discussion? Can't contribute, but um, just just so I'm understanding correctly. So we have um, sodium uh, outside of the cell, and sodium comes in, increases uh, how positive the overall voltage is, and then um, the potassium channels open. Um, so why is it at positive 40 that the, um, the sodium channels close? Yeah, you know, that's, that's probably a discussion between the cell and God. I'm not sure why, <laughs> logically, it said, you know what, this positive 40 is where we're happy. I don't have a good answer to that. I don't know. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. I know there's variance between different cell types. So some cells, you know, they're going to be around maybe 35 or, or 45 or 48. But this is kind of like the textbook MCAT answers. It just used the, the positive 40 millimole. So there's certainly some variation depending on the cell type. But why that is, I don't, I don't know. It probably has to do, if I, if I had to speculate, and again, I'm, I'm completely speculating it's beyond the scope of the MCAT. I'd imagine there's probably some kind of baseline of existing concentrations of various ions and that kind of dynamic somehow contributes to where exactly that that peak at positive 40 or 45 is probably going to be at but mm-hmm. why that exactly is I, I don't really know 
Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Okay, so like I said, we always try to simplify. We add detail. We add a lot of details. And one of the things I always like to do too is try to cheese things, right? So now that we kind of learn how to add and subtract instead of using a calculator, let's see if we can kind of cheese this with a calculator or a way to kind of help us out. Can you go over the inactivation gate? The inactivation gates? As in the pain threshold? Is that what you're talking about? In that, when, when sodium closes, it, it gets inactivated first. Inactivation gate of sodium. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with that, with that term. That terminology. Uh, do, do you want to do you want to try to explain it? Because I'm not familiar with that term. Isn't that like doesn't sodium have two different gates? One is closed. One it's inactivated. So if it's inactivated, it can't open until it reaches a certain voltage. I'm not sure if anyone else is familiar with this. Yeah, I think I'm familiar with it too. I'm not really sure what happens, but I think during depolarization, instead of sodium closing. It like just inactivates. Oh, so you're saying there's there's two states. There's a closing state and, and an inactivation state. Yeah. Is that? Um, I'll be honest. That is not something that I that I learned in in my textbooks or materials that I encountered. I'm it, it's it's possible. I'm sure that's very true. But for the purpose of the MCAT, this is exactly what you need to know. Nothing more. Nothing less. So we don't have to worry about closing versus inactivation state. Similar to like you know. Um, red blood cells, right? The O2 saturation curve. You don't need to know the, that red, red blood cells have a tense and relaxed state, right? That's just a little bit too much for the MCAT. <clears throat> but great comments, yeah. I'll look into it and see what that's all about. Cool. All right, any other comments? So let's talk about this sodium potassium pump in a little bit more detail. And let's first draw what's kind of going on. So I'm going to do a simple version. And I know, guys, I know you guys are impressed with my artistic skills. Okay. I watched a lot of Bob Ross growing up. And so this is a membrane. And I'm just going to quickly draw the sodium potassium pump. And what can you guys tell me about the sodium potassium pump? What do you guys know about it? Three bananas out. Three what? Is so three sodium out. Three sodium out. Let's draw that. So that is um, three sodium out. So let's do maybe we can do Na plus Na plus Na plus to illustrate the the three or to to yeah illustrate the three. And then how many potassium in? Two. Yep, and then two potassium in. Uh, what else are we missing on this? What else is really important here? It's a pump, right? So what do we need to also think about? It uses ATP. Yeah, excellent. It uses ATP. It's a pump, right? Just like you would pump water, well water. Maybe I'm kind of dating, not necessarily dating myself, but I grew up in, in Wyoming as a child, so I did a lot of water pumping, ground well water, okay? Um, you put you you expend some energy, right, to pump that um, to pump water or to pump this gradient across across this concentration gradient. Excuse me, ions again across against this co uh, concentration gradient. So one way I cheese this, right? If you're having trouble remembering this, think of uh, one, two, three, Nokia. Have you guys heard of this before? One, two, three, Nokia. Expand that. No, but I like it. Or I guess not 123, it's 321 Nokia, my bad. 321 Nokia, let me fix that. 321 Nokia, it's a countdown, it's a final countdown. Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. No, all right. So 321 Nokia, and if we just if we think about this, the three refers to, uh, is associated with the NL. So we have three NA out, okay? Three NO. Two Ki. Maybe I should have done this in the same kind of coloring system. So we have two potassium in. And I think you guys can see what's going on with the last letter. And then we've got one 
ATP. One ATP. So three, two, one Nokia. If you ever get confused about that or you don't have this quite memorized, this is kind of a simple, simple mnemonic. So again, what I want to emphasize here is that the sodium potassium pump is separate from these individual potassium and sodium pumps we talked about previously. Okay. All right, so that is the action potential in a nutshell. Um, I think what I want to do um, here is start connecting this to the muscle, right? So I talked about how this is the neuromuscular pathway. I think we've done a good job talking about what's happening at the neuron side of things, and I want to transition to the muscle now. Are there any questions um, or points of clarity or somebody wants to include some additional information that they think might be pertinent to know for the MCAT? Just FYI, too, I'm going to always upload these, this PDF document into the channel, uh, as well as, I believe, Red is going to record this and upload it onto YouTube. So if for whatever reason you want to revisit this lecture, it'll be available on multiple different formats. Okay. And so while you can't take notes, uh, that's probably fine, but I also like it if you guys were active listeners and active participants. I uh, to get the most out of these kind of discussions. So we're in transition, right? So we said, let me redraw this. Let me redraw maybe the the um, the neuron instead of being it, it being horizontally. Maybe we draw the the terminal bud in more of a vertical position, right? So I'm going to draw kind of this axon of the neuron in a vertical position, and then we've got this terminal bulb right here, terminal bulb, and let's say that it's already released acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter. And on the other end of this, this target tissue is going to be a muscle. So let me draw that, and maybe I'll have this foresight of including an acetylcholine receptor, and maybe I'll zoom in a little bit, and maybe kind of do this V-like shape. So then we're going to kind of extend this out just a little bit, and we hit the Grand Canyon, and we kind of have a little pitfall here, a little pit, and then it goes back up and flat again. So let's label everything that we know. Uh, so first off, what is the name, little little anatomy of the of the of the of the muscle cell? What is the name of a muscle cell membrane? What is that called? Sarcolemma. Yeah, it's a sarcolemma. Right, so the membrane is called the sarcolemma, and I'm not sure. I guess lemma is two m's. Somebody correct me. Sarcolemma. Maybe wrong here. That's okay. May just be one. And then acetylcholine. It's what? Yeah, it's two M's. It is two. All right, cool. Thank you. And then the acetylcholine is simply just going to bind, right? It's simply just going to bind to its cognitive receptor. And its cognitive receptor, right? It's pretty straightforward. Not here to trick you. It's just called simply acetylcholine, ACH, acetylcholine receptor, or R, acetylcholine, right? Straightforward. And just like a neuron, right? The the muscle is also going to have a similar transduction pathway or salient pathway, right? So originally there's some, some steady state of, of polarization. So we're going to have kind of similar to the neuron. We have plus and minuses initially. And then when the acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptor, right, those positive charges are now able to move inside of the cell. And what's going to happen is those positive charges are going to travel along the membrane and hit this Grand Canyon. And what is this Grand Canyon? What is, what's, what's the name of it? And what is its purpose? Anybody? What is this, this kind of like this hole-like thing, this little pit? What is that called? It's called a T-tubule. Right, so this is called a T tubule. 
And what does the T stand for? Transverse? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a transverse. T stands for transverse. Okay. Transverse tubule. And what is the purpose of this crevice, this pit, or this T tubule? What's the point of this? For the action potential travels down to. To what? The muscle cell or to activate the calcium pumps. Yeah, very you're good, right? So a lot of the, the I guess you could say, kind of the sarcomere um, mechanisms that we'll talk about here in a moment are kind of located towards this towards the interior or the center of a muscle cell, okay? And so it's important for this action potential to get down there. That's why these pits exist, to kind of help or lend themselves um, in their ability to, to get and interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release this calcium. And so there's this, there's this protein complex that you don't need to know, and I'll be honest, I forget the name of it now, but it acts almost like a voltage-gated trap door, kind of like a jack-in-the-box, okay? And when the action potential interacts with this complex, and again, you don't need to know this detail for the MCAT. Well, you need to know that this action potential, when it travels down a T-tubule, allows for the release of calcium from sarco sarcoplasmic reticulum, but you don't need to know the name of this complex. Kind of scapegoating here just a little bit. Right, it then allows for that calcium to escape. So when this this protein complex, jack in the box protein complex, encounters this action potential, this trap door opens up. Okay, just springs right open, and then what happens is this calcium can now escape and it then is, interacts with troponin. Okay, and we'll talk about that here in just a moment. And this, let me label everything. This bag of calcium is known as the sarco, sarcomane muscle, sarcoplasmic reticulum, reticulum. And so it's just a modified ER. It's a modified endoplasmic reticulum. It's modified for the muscle and sarcoplasmic reticulum to hold calcium. Okay. So this calcium is going to move out of this organelle, this specialized organelle known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it's going to interact with troponin. That is kind of spiraled, spiraled around actin. So we're going to draw that. So the calcium 2 plus now in, in the cytoplasm. And maybe because, you know, it's, it's, it's the holiday, maybe we'll kind of use some Christmas colors here a little bit. And so we're going to have this flute-like structure. Let me draw that out. We're going to have this. Maybe I'll draw this just a little bit lower. And maybe I'll draw this a little bit smaller, too. Or this nougat-like structure, right? Maybe like a Twix cookie bar. Actually, let me do this in a different color. And... Hey, I'll just do a couple here. I don't want to do, don't want to overdo it. I know. So this, this nougat, this Twix cookie bar is the actin. And we'll talk about what actin does and, and everything else here in a moment as well. And around it, around these, these red sites, these, these red sites are known as what? Um, these are known as the myosin binding site. They have other names too. Sometimes called the myosin troponin binding site or myosin binding site for short. I'll write that out. So this is the myosin binding site or binding sites. And these are typically covered by troponin in green. So green is troponin. Okay, so green is this troponin. And it kind of loops around this actin. I guess I could have done the spiral a little bit better, but you guys get the idea. So troponin is this green, 
Again, like I said, I'm just trying to make this a little bit faster, right? Christmas colors. It is the season. And specifically, it binds to a subunit of troponin called troponin C. C for calcium. Okay, cool. So when calcium binds, right? So when this calcium, the Ca2 plus binds, let me draw this differently. When this calcium binds to proponent C, what happens, you guys? You guys know this already. What happens? It removes the binding site so myosin can bind. Yeah, it moves the troponin, right? It shifts it so it exposes these red dots, these myosin binding sites. So allowing for myosin to bind, hence myosin binding site. Okay, so let's draw that out. So when calcium to Ca2 plus binds, right, it exposes those myosin binding sites. So let me quickly draw that. Very basic. And so maybe now, right, the troponin is in between these red dots. Maybe I'll draw this correctly now, this interweaving. Okay. And so, yeah, exactly exposes those binding sides, right? So the calcium is still attached. Calcium is still hanging out, chilling. What's up? And now, like you mentioned, the myosin can bind. So let's draw the myosin now. So it's almost like a sandwich, right? So myosin is actually another bar we can draw. And this myosin bar, maybe I'll kind of draw this in black-ish, right? So this is the myosin. And the myosin has these myosin heads. And these myosin heads, right, are able to come up and now bind to these red dots, these myosin binding sites. And I'll just do three for simplicity, right? So myosin heads, myosin heads, bind. And when they bind, they have some kind of contraction, right? They kind of, they kind of, they kind of move from, kind of move, let me do like a dotted line here. So the original position is kind of horizontally, and then when the binding sites are exposed, along with some hydrolysis of ADP, right, these guys are gonna come up, smack that my or smack that red dot on its head, and you know, move it across, contract it in one direction. Okay, so that's kind of the prelude to how uh, the sarcomere and all this other stuff, the sliding filament theory is thought to work. And we'll talk about that here next in a little more detail. So the head is kind of laying down ish. Actually, it should be caught back. It should be kind of flat, the head originally, and along with some other mechanisms, right? And once those mice and binding sites have been exposed to, it's going to come up, smack it over the head, and push everything in. Okay? Any questions on this so far? Right? Again, we're trying to keep things simple, simple and stupid. Okay? KISS, K I S S. Okay? And then we add details to it, right? We want to try to keep things as simple as possible because guess what? There's a lot of complex ideas on the MCAT. Uh, let's not try to make this any more complicated than we have to. Okay. All right. So any questions on this before we move on to the sliding filament model? Can anybody tell me what the sliding filament model is? With the sarcomere? Yes, it has to do with the sarcomere. And what does it describe? Is it how the muscle contracts? Yeah, exactly. Right. So we kind of preluded, kind of, kind of showed it here, but we need to know a little more details for the MCAT. Okay. So that's what we're going to transition into now. So we're going to talk about the sliding, sliding filament model. And this gave me a lot of trouble, you guys, when I first st was studying for the MCAT. I think I had to teach this like two times to my study group because I had so many issues with it. It took me a hot minute to really have it down. And so you guys are going to be beneficial or a benefit to that, right? You guys are going to be the benefactors of that effort. Uh, and hopefully um, we can kind of simplify this, this concept if you're having troubles with it. I, my experience has been that a lot of students kind of have issues with the sliding filament model, something they get kind of nervous about. You know, they look at it and then they kind of forget it three days later or, or you know, maybe the day after. And so there's a sense, there's that false sense of mastery when it comes to sliding filament model. 
And I think part of that is just, there's just too much details, right? And there's a lot of confusing materials or descriptions out there. So we're going to try to avoid some of those pitfalls. We're going to try to make sure that you guys do memorize this at the level that you need to for the purpose of the MCAT. And if you have to, right, with everything else, whatever I teach you guys, try to teach somebody else, right? To teach is to learn twice. So to start off with, you guys just need to know four pictures. And really, I think if you can memorize the first kind of landing spot or, yeah, landmark, you guys should be fine, okay? So I like to draw, or I like to think about death. That's kind of morbid, okay? Um, but it's going to help us understand where to start with a sliding filament model. And I think if you understand what happens upon, you know, death of a living organism or living organism in general, yeah, um, this will make things a lot easier. So when somebody is dead, they're said to be in rigor mortis. Or it's, you know, early on in the death cycle, um, they're said to be in rigor mortis. And what is rigor mortis? Can anybody tell me what that means? You have no more ATP, so you can't go back. Control. Yeah, there's no more ATP. And we've also he heard the saying, what does rigor mean? Rigor means what? Stiff, right? Mortis is deaf. And we've also heard the saying, stiff as a board. Stiff as a board. Stiff as a, a board. Yep, he was stiff as a board. Did you hear about Kevin? He passed away last night. He's stiff as a board. Some bad juju coming away. I'm, I'm like putting on myself. That's no good. And so what I want you guys to think about is kind of this a Velcro analogy. What's, got, what's happening between the myosin and the actin? Okay. And I'll expand on this by drawing here just in a moment. So I want you guys to think about this Velcro, Velcro analogy, this, this, this cause for this stiffness. Velcro analogy. Analogy. And imagine, you know, you're interlocking your, your fingers. Not interlocking in the sense like holding hands, but we're going to, well, I guess kind of like holding hands almost. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your top hand and you're going to squeeze your fingers together and line them up just like this, right? So you're, all your fingers are in line kind of in curved. Your fingers are bending together, okay? And then your other hand, right, you, squeeze, you put all your fingers together as well and you curve it as well. And this time upwards. So now the other hand, all the fingers are together and they're doing one of these actions, right? So it's almost like this Velcro hook analogy, right? You form these little hooks with your hands. And when you do this, right, when you put them together and you try to pull them apart, hopefully you guys are doing this as well. Good thing my camera isn't on, so I look like an idiot. But, right, it's this Velcro analogy. It's essentially what's happening here between the myosin and the actin. They're interconnected and they're stuck. They're in this Velcro position, and they're interlocked. They can't go anywhere, right? You can't pull your hands apart very easily when you have them hooked against each other, okay? So, again, this is all intuition, right? Rigor mortis, no ATP. We know that. If there was ATP, the person would probably still be alive. We know that they're stiff as a board because there's no ATP being made, right? Because they have no cell cellular life currency left. And that's because the myosin and the... Actin, so the actin would be on top, the myosin would be on bottom, are interlocked. So let's draw that a little bit more in detail. Just a little bit more in detail. So we have two bars here, a top bar, and we're going to call this the actin. And the bottom bar of the sandwich is the myosin. So that's the myosin. And the myosin heads are engaged. Right? That's that hook-like feature of this interlocking, this Velcro analogy. So nothing can move. Nothing, nothing is going on here. So if we want this to move, well, we better add some energy to this, right? Because right now it's a zero energy state. So if you're at a rock bottom, well, what are you going to do? Just you're going to add some energy to this, right? You're going to add some gasoline to the engine in the form of ATP. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to add ATP to this bad boy. ATP. And when that happens, these heads, these myosin hooks, these myosin heads are going to um, release. They're going to release. So let's draw what that looks like. So I got my top sandwich, or top bread of my sandwich, which is the actin, and then the bottom got our myosin, 
right? And now these hooks have released and they have ATP attached to them. Maybe I'll draw this a little bit bigger for consistency with these three hooks. Stand this out just a little bit more. So the ATP releases the myosin heads from interacting with the actin. Okay. Now, if you have ATP, you have to do something with that ATP, right? You can't just chill there. And so what we're going to do is just like many signal pathways, that ATP gets hydrolyzed. Okay, so we're going to go ATP hydrolysis. And that's going to be our next picture. So we're going to go ATP hydrolysis, hydrolysis. And we're going to lose a phosphate. Okay, we're going to lose a phosphate. And what we have remaining then is ADP, not a T, but D, AD, like dog, ADP. Okay. And so let's draw what's going to happen here. So again, we've got our top bread, our actin bread of the sandwich on top. And then on the bottom, we've got our myosin. Actually, let me do, do a little bit extra spacing in between. Let me move that slightly down. And so when this undergoes hydrolysis, notice the picture above, right? Originally, we have this situation here. Originally, we've got our myosin head, which is pointing upward, okay? Originally, it's kind of pointing up. And actually, let me go back and highlight that fact from the last drawing a little bit more. So these heads are kind of in this vertical position up and down, okay? And so when we undergo ATP losses, what's going to happen is we get cocking. We cock back that head from this vertical up-down position to a horizontal position. Okay. So actually, let me do this slightly different. Let me do a dotted outline of this vertical head. And okay, that was the previous step. So originally, the heads or in a vertical position, when we have ATP hydrolysis, that head is going to go from a vertical position to a horizontal position. It's going to go like that, okay? You guys here, I'll just do two, that's fine. And attached onto this head is still is ADP, ADP with a D. That's chilling out. And this is known as cocking. Right, so this is caulking, something you may have read about as you were studying the sliding filament theory. Okay, and this is something that a lot of students kind of struggle with. Okay, and there's a lot of like weird analogies out there with like caulking the head or the hammer back from a pistol, for instance, but that may not be obvious um, from the description. So I think this picture is really, really important to understand what that caulking means. Okay, you're just turning that head from a vertical position up down, and when you undergo ADP hydrolysis, you kind of pull back that head that hammer to a horizontal position. So we got one more picture, right? Four pictures in total. Uh, the last one is, is going to be known as the power stroke. Okay, so we've got, we've got to do something with this ADP now. Okay, and what we're going to do is undergo ADP hydrolysis. ADP hydrolysis. And in this case, we're actually going to lose this ADP entirely. This entire ADP is going to be removed. Okay. Some sources, by the way, when you look at the sliding filament source um, model, some pictures or descriptions will combine both ATP and ADP into one step. This hydrolysis, no, these two different hydrolysis steps into one. Okay. I recommend that you know that they're separate and understand the differences because you will be asked about it on the MCAT. Okay. What happens with ATP hydrolysis and what happens for ADP hydrolysis? So it's important that you know all four steps. So when we lose ADP hydrolysis, right, this ADP, right, it's got two phosphate groups, right, there's still some negative repulsion, right, and so we can harvest that, that energy between that electrochemical energy between these two phosphate groups to do, to still do some extra work, right, it still, it still has energy, energy is work, we can utilize that in the body. And that's going to allow us to do the power stroke. 
So here's our top bread of the sandwich, the actin. Start the lower half of that sandwich. That's the myosin. And now, right, those, those heads that were originally linear, when they lose ADP, they're going to come up and they're going to smack the heck out of that, that actin. They're going to come up, okay, and as they move up, they're also going to slap it or contract it inward, okay? So what that's going to look like is that this is just going to kind of pull, pull inward, okay? It's going to come up and slap it inward, bam, okay? Hopefully that analogy works out. And this is what's known as the power stroke. This is the power stroke. So the power stroke is not, does not occur, right, with ATP hydrolysis. A lot of students make that mistake because we think of ATP being kind of that energy currency. So it's easy to misattribute the power stroke for that. In fact, what you need to memorize is actually the ADP hydrolysis that induces this power stroke. And then the cycle just continues around and around and around. So let me quiz you guys on this. And anybody's welcome to chime in. What does calcium binding do? When calcium binds, what does it do? Myosin so, bind to actin. So the calcium, when it binds, we didn't we didn't talk about it here in much detail in the sliding filament model, but we did introduce it one step before. So when the calcium binds, right, like you said, it kind of it binds to troponin and it, it exposes the myosin or myosin troponin binding sites. So it exposes the myosin binding sites. Good. You will need to know that for the MCAT. What happens when ATP binds. Can anybody explain that to me? What happens with ATP binding? Myosin. Let's let's go of actin. Yep. Uh, it releases the ATP. Right. Releases releases the myosin from the actin. Perfect. Chef's kiss. Mwah! Perfection. Okay. You will need to know that. All right, so let's hot potato it. Somebody else. What happens when ATP hydrolysis occurs? What happens there? You get the caulking effect? Yeah, and explain to me what this caulking effect is. Uh, you you basically have uh, the form uh, the ADP uh, binding with the heads and kind of like pulling it backwards. Yeah. So we're talking the myosin head, and we get it from vertical, right, from that vertical position to horizontal. Horizontal. Perfect. And then since I had you up here, what does the ADP hydrolysis do? Uh, it's it's the power stroke where like the the ADP um, leaves through ADP hydrolysis and uh, kind of ca causes like a I guess you could say like a slingshot catapult effect. Yeah. I like that analogy. Yeah, yeah, awesome. I like that slingshot analogy. Okay, I had a sassy grandmother who kind of you know I was kind of um, I was a sassy individual myself growing up. So you know my, my grandmother wasn't uh, wasn't scared to kind of give me a power stroke once in a while across the face. Okay. Different times, different times. Probably deserved it, okay? But very much similar in the same vein. Awesome. So what I recommend, right, if you're struggling with the sliding filament model, maybe screenshot um, this, this picture, put it on a card, and make sure that you know all these different steps. So what I maybe do is maybe make a subfolder on Anki and include each one of these steps. You know, what happens to calcium binding, ATP, um, binding ATP hydrolysis and ADP. You do need to know that for the MCAT because they will ask you about what happens. Okay. And so one of the questions you might be asked is, well, what is the effect if no calcium binds to myosin? What would you expect phenotypically to occur?
from the muscle bone contract. Yeah, it'll be it'll be flaccid, right? It'll be loose, loosey goosey. Because the myosin, remember, the calcium, right? It it binds this troponin and exposes these myosin binding heads to allow myosin to engage with, right? And if the myosin heads are engaged, then you can, you expect that the muscle becomes more rigid, okay? Since the muscle tissues or the filaments can't slide past each other, hence sliding filament model, okay? They can't slide past each other. So if there's no calcium then those myosin halves aren't engaged in that Velcro analogy we talked about. And so you'd expect the patient to have kind of this soft muscle tissue that's really loose. It's flaccid, okay? Now, if you don't have any ATP, there's no ATP, what would you expect? The muscle to be stiff. Yeah, the muscle be stiff, right? So if there's a toxin that prevents ATP utilization in the muscles, okay, like tetanus, right? You you probably expect uh, muscle stiffness, right? Awesome. So those are some ways that you might be tested on this material, okay? And I've also seen questions I just straight up ask you about how aspects of the slime filament, how that works. One of these four points that we've made. Calcium binding, ATP binding, ATP hydrolysis, and ADP hydrolysis, okay? So uh, make sure that you review this. It is, I'd say, it's not super high yield. But I'd probably say I put it kind of down to the, the medium yield, okay? But it's, it is worth your time. Uh, let me kind of ask you guys and kind of verbalize this, or maybe do it in the chat real quick. That might be easier. How many of you would want to go over the structure of a sarcomere, right? So the midline, the H zone, the A, A band. How many of you guys in the chat, the voice one chat, would want to do that? Give you guys a couple of seconds to type that out. Okay, all right, so John says yes. Ali. It's not going to take that long, I promise you. Andrew is like, if it's considered high yield, well, um, it's not super high yield. It's also medium yield. All right. All right. So, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forewarn you. This is going to look like a Picasso at the end of this. Okay. So, um, here's the deal. Here's the deal. If you guys, okay, this is going to be our little thing right now. If you guys draw out a sarcomere, just like I have, or maybe even better, but if you guys draw that out for me, and you guys put it on your fridge, something like grandma would be, do, right? So like, like a coloring book or a coloring drawing or whatever. You put it on your fridge, you take a picture of it, okay? The first person to do that after the session. So it can't be right away. It can't be right away. Okay? Let's say a 30-minute buffer in between this, whenever the session ends. If you guys do that, I'll give you guys um, individually a one-hour free tutoring session, okay? So I'm trying to encourage you guys, okay, to own this material, because doing it, right, going through this process and not just being an active recipient of my lectures, okay, but actually doing it is going to help you retain that information. So the first person, or maybe I'll do it for the first two or three people. That's fine, too. First two or three people that do that, draw it out, put it on the fridge, take a picture of it, and send it my way, whether it be in chat, whether it be email, phone number, whatever. It doesn't matter, okay? Give you guys a free hour of tutoring, whatever you guys need help on. All right, so hopefully that kind of perked you guys up a little bit. Okay, I know this can be a little bit dry. So let's try the sarcomere. And actually in chat too, how many of you guys have seen uh, South Park? This is actually important. This is very important, guys. How many of you guys have seen South Park? How many of you guys have seen South Park? Like, Kevin, you're reaching today, man. What is going on? All right, so John is like, heck yeah. I haven't seen South Park for like 10 years, but I'll admit, some okay, all right, all right, okay. So you guys, you guys, uh, you guys probably maybe remember that clip from South Park of the teacher. I forget the name of the teacher, but he always said okay, mm right? He always says okay. Mm you guys know what I'm talking about a little bit. Okay. Oh, he's like, yeah, I get you. Maybe I'll show a South Park video real quick, so everybody's kind of on the same boat. So the reason I bring that up, okay. Is this how I remember the organization of a sarcomere? 
So I was thought of Mr. I think it's Mr. Hanky was the teacher. Could be wrong. Um, like I said, it's been about a decade since I saw South Park, but that MK always stuck with me. Okay, and it stuck with me here because when I think of the sarcomere, I think of the word hey, not MK, but hey, and that tells you the order of the sarcomere. Hey, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start saying that. So I'm saying okay all the time. I'm gonna start saying hey. So hey, let's draw this out. And the way I want you guys to think about this first is that you should start off drawing the sarcomere with this floating shelf. It's actually a metal shelf. Okay. And this metal shelf is also known as the A band. And can anybody tell me, I give me kind of clue based on my shading, what the A band is made up of? Thick and thin. I'm sorry, say again? It has both thick and thin filaments. Good, yeah. So it's, it's uh, it, yes, you're not wrong there. It overlaps with both the thick and thin filament, absolutely. But the A band is essentially just the myosin, just the myosin band. Okay, we'll, we'll see that here in a moment. So let's draw the thin bands real quick since you mentioned it. So the thin bands. Actually, let's go and order this M. Hey, that'd be nice since I brought it up. M. Hey. So the M, what is the M, you guys? What is the M? Myosin? No, the M is just the midline, M line for midline. It's just a relative designation to say, oh, yeah, you know, in the middle of this, that's the M line or the midline or the middle line. Okay, that's all it is. Okay, so let me draw the rest of the sarcomere so we can label the rest of these areas. So we said, well, we got the thick, thick band, which is the A band, and then we also have the thin band. Let me draw that. And what's on top is also on bottom. Double the fun, double mint gum. And we said, well, the A band is myosin, right? And this myosin has the myosin heads, right? So we draw that again. And again, there's that kind of symmetry, right? So whatever's on top is also on bottom. So let's draw that. Okay. Thank you, Hada. A little too soon. Okay. So now, we have the myosin band. We've got the little actin, just like before, right? Just like this is very similar to what we just drew in the slide filament model, right? We've got the, the actin on top, the myosin on bottom, similar to this. And what's going to happen is this is going to contract inward, right? So when those myosin heads, right, engage, it'll push that actin towards the center, towards the, towards the midline, okay? It's going to contract inward like this. So we talk about M. So M is the the midline. What is the H? What is H? What is H? Is it like the space between the thin, um, I guess the actin? Yeah, the actin, right? Yeah, it's this area right here in yellow, right? From in between one one actin to another, this open area right here, and there's overlap, right? So it it covers some of this A band. It's just this region here in between um, the two actin bands. And it doesn't matter what's in between. We don't care. And give me a moment to fill that in. Like I said, like I mentioned, right, this is going to start like a, start looking like a modern retro painting here. Beautiful. I'm very, very talented, I know. OK, so that's the M. First thing that's the M, and then the H is in yellow. Let me highlight that in yellow. And so that is, maybe I'll do this also in green to highlight what that is. So that's, that's the, from the space, right, from the thin to thin line of band, or the, the actin to the actin, that's, that's the H zone, H zone, the danger zone, okay? Maybe I'll zoom in just a little bit. We got space, so you guys can see it better. 
Okay, so what's the A? Well, we said what the A is, right? We say A is this, this, this floating metal shelf in the center here. And so maybe I'll do that in magenta, this A. And so A is any area where the A band is. So there's overlap, right? There's a lot of overlap. And it's not just limited to the A band, okay? It's also stuff below and on top of the A band. And maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do it like this to indicate there's overlap. Oh my gosh, I know this is going to get crazy, right? A little bit. Okay. Toy is going to look like a Picasso painting. Okay. Very interpretive. Okay. Hence why I want you guys to put this on your fridge. Not my drawing, your guys' own. Okay. And then, so that's the A, and then the I, we kind of said it, the I is just the I band, right? So the I band is just these, this actin band. And sometimes this I band is also called the thin bands. So we got a lot of, we got a lot of I's here, right? So the thin, the thin band's got the, the letter I in it. Actin's got the word, or the letter I in it. You can spell actin, that'd be nice. Actin, got I in it. And then so I band is for the thin band or the actin. I for I for I, okay? And that's simply just gonna be wherever we've got actin, okay? So that's gonna be all of this, okay? All right, so I know this is, is beautiful. I know this is amazing looking, okay? And hopefully this all makes sense, okay? And so now this looks like what? It almost looks like a water cup, like a paper water cup with those weird colors, right? Um, that's fine. The only thing we did include here is the Z-bands. I think most people know what the Z-bands are, right? There's just the ziggy zaggy lines here, hence the Z-band. And one thing, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna label it as a Z-band, I think that's, that's obvious, okay? Beautiful painting, I know. Um, but there's a reason why I also call the A-band a metal floating shelf, metal for a reason. And the reason why I say that is because you might be asked a question that says something like, which of the following, which of the following sections of the sarcomere section or sections does not, does not change in shape? And the answer to that is what? Or instead of does not change in shape, let's say does not contract. Let me make this bigger since I know it's very small. 24? Yeah. So which of the following regions or bands does not contract during a muscle contraction? Is it the is it the A band? Is it the I band? Is it the H zone? What do you guys think? I'm guessing H zone. The H zone will get smaller, right? So as the I bands come in together, right, as they close in, I know it's kind of hard to see with this beautiful drawing, but as the I bands on each side come together, they're going to make that H zone a little bit smaller, right? The H zone is in between the I bands. So it's not the H zone. Good guess, though. It's this A band, right? The A band, right? That's that metal floating beam that I used, floating beam analogy, because metal is kind of hard to contract, right? Right? And so the A band, this the, or this myosin, this myosin band, right, resists changes. Okay, it's not going to change during contraction. It's the one doing the contraction, right? It has the myosin heads attached to it. It's the one doing the contraction. So you wouldn't expect it to contract itself. Okay, that'd be no way not. Right. So beautiful Picasso drawing. I know it's incredibly lovely. You or me. Draw this out because this looks like uh, a third grader drew it. And maybe that's even uh, worse than that. Maybe uh, a preschooler drew this, okay? I'll take it. I'll take the insult. It's fine, but draw this out. Do the same kind of highlighting thing, right? Have some fun with it. If you have kids, maybe draw the outline and have them do it with you, right? Make this a family event, I suppose. But uh, draw this out a couple times. That's the best way to understand what's going on here, okay? And it's going to be color vomit. That's cool. That's fine. I feel like Kevin, that did not help me out that much at all. That's okay. Like I said, it's kind of a low yield material. And the other thing you need to know is muscle organization, right? 
And when I say that, most students are like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Nope. I don't joke. Except for dad jokes. Okay. Um, so I have some pictures ready to go here. Let me paste that here. So this is going to be, make that slightly bigger so we can see it just fine. And I'm going to tell you exactly what you guys need to know. Okay. So in terms of organization for the MCAT, you need to know that you start off with a muscle. The muscle is the largest organizational group. Muscle, that's this big guy right here. Let me highlight that in yellow so it's not labeled. You need to know that a muscle is broken down in what's called fascicles. And fascicles are broken down into muscle fibers. What's another name for a muscle fiber? Anybody? Myocyte. It's a myocyte. Good. What's another name for a myocyte? What's kind of the layman term of a myocyte? If you broke that down into regular common parlance, regular American, what would that be? What does myo mean? Myo means muscle. Site means cell, right? So this is a, a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. Okay. And the muscle cell itself, one muscle cell has, is broken down into multiple myofibrils. Myo, again, means muscle fibril, kind of cutesy way to say small fiber. And then the myofibril is broken down into sarcomeres. Okay. So this is what you need to know. Everything in yellow here is what you need to know. You don't need to know about these different inclusions or these, these, these wrappings like the epimesium or the peri or the endo. Don't worry about that. Worry about everything that's in yellow, in yellow, okay? Um, all right, so muscle organization in a nutshell. Uh, these last two things we talked about, the sarcomere, the, 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 the shape of the sarcomere, the different zones, okay? And the muscle organization, not very high yield on the MCAT, okay? That's, that's pretty low yield stuff, so nothing to fret about there. However, everything else is high yield, right? That neuromuscular pathway, the sliding filament model, that's all high yield, okay? So everything above the sarcomere, this mm hey, is high yield, or medium to high yield. Yeah? Why did you call it ADP hydrolysis? Doesn't that mean ADP goes to AMP for the power stroke? No, for your, where you say ADP is hydrolysis is your power stroke? Yeah, so it, it, this is... And so you wouldn't be wrong there, right? So it certainly can be hydro, hydro, hydrolyzed um, to AMP. So that's 100% that's, that's correct. Um, I'm choosing to simplify this drawing. So we're not including extra steps we don't need to know, okay, for the purpose of the MCAT and for simplification. Less is sometimes more, okay? Because it will not ask you about, and it's, it's a bit unclear as well. So when you look at this online, there they haven't, scientists haven't quite understood what exactly happens with this ADP hydrolysis. Is it one step, like I've shown here, or is there an intermediate step, a second step, like you've mentioned? Okay. So that is a little bit fuzzy, and I think for the purpose of the MCAT, less is more, and this is what you need to know. Okay, great question. Yeah, because when I do it's ADP plus phosphate released is a power stroke. But, yeah, yeah. And, sure. sure. You could say, you know, so like I said, some sources, pictures will just say, oh, this undergoes ATP hydrolysis. It combines these last two steps. And what you get is AMP and, and inorganic phosphate releasing. For the purpose of the MCAT, this is what you need to know. This is how they're going to test it. Great comments. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not wrong. Now that you're just wrong, it's just a matter of preference and how this information is presented. Sorry, I missed the part about what which part was high yield and which one was